Let's talk about two different problems going on in the war between Russia and Ukraine. Problem number one. Ukraine fires way, way more artillery each month than what the West is currently capable of replacing. This has led to suboptimal outcomes, like a slower-than-hoped-for Ukrainian summer offensive, and the United States shipping cluster munitions to Kyiv, despite the humanitarian concerns that come along with those. Problem number two. The war continues, at least in part, because Russia and Ukraine disagree about the West's long-term commitment to defending Ukraine. The Kremlin suspects that the West will eventually get tired of the war and curtail military aid, wanting to save a little bit of money. At that point, Russia can solidify its gains or perhaps press for more. The West, meanwhile, wants to convince Russia that Kyiv will receive whatever it needs to expel Russian soldiers from its borders. This creates a classic lines-on-maps problem, where differing expectations like these, regarding the war's outcome, makes it impossible for the parties to reach a deal. So we have insufficient artillery production and divergent beliefs, two completely different problems with the war. But what if I told you that they were actually the same problem? With that in mind, today we are going to discuss why artillery production has been so poor, a relatively simple solution to that problem, how fixing that also fixes the information discrepancy, and a fun bonus on how the same strategy does not work in autocracies, like Russia. Let's start with the West's inability to manufacture artillery. Given existing infrastructure, it is literally impossible to produce the quantity of artillery that Ukraine wants. Such is life in 2023, when more than half of the world's population was born after the Cold War ended. The United States bears some responsibility here, but much of it falls on Europe's failure to live up to the NATO benchmark of spending at least 2% of GDP on defense annually. Obtaining good numbers on this is a challenge, because, well, that's just war. But a conservative estimate is that Russia fires 20,000 artillery shells per day. Ukraine is doing something like a quarter of that. And it is not for a lack of desire. Kyiv just does not have the resources to do more. With that in mind, I want you to meet the 155mm shell, a microcosm of the problem. They are your common artillery munition for a howitzer, and are standardized for production by NATO countries. Germany only had 20,000 in stock at the start of the war. The entirety of Europe's annual production is estimated at only 300,000. Thus, with baseline capacity the problem, and not just with the 155mm, to meet Ukraine's needs, businesses must invest in all of the R&D, factory creation, and hiring required for new production. One problem. Doing all of that is very expensive. So expensive, in fact, that the company cannot recoup the investment with only a year or two of production. That is a major problem if the war ends relatively quickly, and artillery demand suddenly dries up. Thus, the weapons manufacturer faces a dilemma. Do they make a risky investment? or do they hold their cash in reserve? If you want to know why Ukraine is shell-starved, then look no further than here. The West has the ability, in theory, to meet Ukraine's needs. But on the ground right now, that is not happening. The incentives for the arms manufacturers are not aligned, and the investment has not been happening to the degree that it needs to. It turns out there is a simple solution to this problem. To find it, all we have to do is look at humanity's recent past when we solved an almost identical problem. But there is one major difference between the enemy being a strategic actor versus an astrategic virus. Hold that thought for a minute. During the COVID-19 pandemic, businesses had to decide whether to invest in production of all sorts of things, including masks and vaccines. The risk here was that if the pandemic suddenly ended, demand for those products would plummet, and the businesses would fall deep into the red. 
governments intervened with a relatively elegant solution. Offer guaranteed contracts. Regardless of how the pandemic unfolded, they would still buy hundreds of millions of supplies. Doing so shifts all of the risk onto the government. The businesses now know that they will get paid one way or another, and so they are all too happy to invest in the infrastructure that the government seeks. Moving back to the war, this is now the debate that is being had within capitals all over the West. That is, to guarantee artillery purchases for years to come. It is a quick fix, as long as the governments are willing to foot the bill no matter what. But it is more than that. Guaranteed artillery production also helps resolve the information asymmetry. Ordinarily, settling this sort of disagreement is not straightforward. You can't just ask the other side whether they are truly committed, and expect it to elicit an honest answer. Here, that is because, if Putin took the West's assurances at face value, he would be tempted to leave the country and not continue a losing battle. But then, an uncommitted West, who still wants Russia out, but is unwilling to actually pay the price to do so, could lie and get its way. The traditional solution to resolve the credibility gap is something known as a costly signal. In this context, it is a price that you pay regardless of how the opponent responds, as if the money were lit on fire. When the West says that it is committed to Ukraine and pays a substantial sum in the process, it conveys inherent sincerity in the message. After all, if the West were not resolved, then governments would be unwilling to pay the price even if they knew that Putin would retreat. But I have to stress that the key to this is that the money is unrecoverable. If there are full takebacks here, then there would be no risk in trying to bluff the greater resolve. Thus, the prescription is simple. Guarantee the contracts. Putin then knows that the armaments are coming one way or another. Watch as those previously diverging beliefs suddenly converge. Make progress toward ending the war. And that is the cool difference between this and COVID. When a coronavirus hears that a gazillion doses of vaccine are set for guaranteed production, well, for one thing, that's terrifying because now they've grown ears, it does not just raise a white flag and fold back into the ether. In contrast, that could happen with a strategic opponent. In fact, every day that the West is not doing this, is another day that Putin is getting small confirmations of his own skeptical beliefs. Now, to be clear, guaranteed contracts for artillery production do not guarantee the end of the war. We have talked before about how other bargaining frictions exist, Putin's personal incentives chief among them, that may also be prolonging the fighting. But insofar as information is a barrier to the end of the invasion, Guaranteed contracts are a solution. As a quick bonus point, it is worth noting that the strategy outlined is something that would not even be an option in Russia. Remember how there cannot be takebacks, otherwise the credibility of the signal is lost? Contracts make that work in Western-style governments with strong, independent courts. If the war suddenly ended in five months, and the president decided to cancel the guaranteed contract, the manufacturer can simply take the government to court, and win. That is a neat but underappreciated thing about the rule of law. You can sue your own government, and then another body of the government can confirm that the initial body of the government was wrong, and you can receive a remedy. As a result, the Western-style government is paying the guaranteed contract one way or another. In contrast, if the Kremlin reneges on a military contract, bless anyone seeking a court injunction. Producers are stuck with whatever the new terms are that are issued. But Russian businesses are cognizant of the problem, making them reluctant to accept contracts in the first place or enter the military sector at all. Ironically, this is a case where a government having flexibility comes back to haunt it. It is an issue that plagued Russia going into the war, 
and we have seen the consequences of that on the battlefield. Do you know what else can be taken back? My book on the causes of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That is what returns are for. Not that you will need to, because you will love it. Check the video description for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care. A while back, I tried having ChatGPT write an outro. It wasn't great. However, I have noticed as I am writing that predictive text is not too bad, so let's take it to the extreme. I will give a single word, and then autofill the next word until we finish a coherent sentence, or die trying. First prompt, Putin. Is there any room to be at home for a quick dinner at the house on Tuesday? Hopefully he can squeeze us in. Next prompt, Zelensky to be there at least two months ago. I could not have done that. Uh, okay, that was not a sentence. By the way, I think we now know how I would talk if I actually were an AI. Next prompt, Shoigu is taking the dog out. Aww. Okay, what about Gerasimov? To be there at least two months ago, I could not have done that. That is literally the same sentence that we just had for Zelensky. Conspiracy theory. Are they the same person? All I'm saying is that I have never seen the two of them in the same room together. If you have, let me know. Next up, Ukraine needs a new update. Well, that is what I'm here for. All right, let's switch to Russia. China, China, Korea, Russia, Russia, Germany, Russia, Russia, Korea, China, Russia, Korea, Korea, China, Russia, China, Korea. I think we need to stop there, otherwise this could go on forever. Prigozhin, to be honest, I don't have a lot to say about this. <laughs> That's a good place to end. But hey, if you try doing this on your phone and you get a good one, go ahead and type it into the comments.